the extraordinary life of Princess Alice, the Duke of Edinburgh's mother and the Queen's mother-in-law, is one of the best-kept secrets in royal history. A daredeviling story that would be worthy of any great Hollywood film. Born in Windsor Castle, she begins life as a privileged royal. She was most Diana-like because she was regarded as the prettiest princess in Europe. But from the start, Alice is no ordinary princess. She was basically stone deaf. She ended up being able to lip read in Greek, German and English. She serves as a nurse on the front line. She was hands-on. I mean, she was dealing with broken limbs and amputated limbs. She goes on to face huge personal challenges and is committed to an asylum. She is hearing voices that she's in a relationship with, with Jesus Christ. She would overcome these struggles to help those in need. This film will reveal the secrets of Alice's extraordinary life using rarely seen archive and interviews with those directly affected by her selfless actions, including the Jewish family she saved from the Nazis. If it hadn't been for her, I wouldn't be alive today. Ultimately, she devotes her life to helping others. She'd set up an order of nuns to do her humanitarian work. The amazing character who indefatigably survived through some of the toughest events of, of the 20th century. Alice was a woman who refused to fit the royal mold. Why has her remarkable life remained out of the public spotlight for so long? Princess Alice is very definitely the royal family's best kept secret. And what a fascinating life she's had. On a winter's day in December 1969, London goes about its business largely unaware of the sadness within the walls of Buckingham Palace. Princess Alice, who was the Duke of Edinburgh's mother, mother-in-law to the Queen and grandmother to Prince Charles, has died in her sleep. Reporting of Alice's death is minimal. It makes just the fourth item in the night's news. The BBC announcement read, the Duke of Edinburgh's mother, Princess Andrew of Greece, died today at Buckingham Palace. The princess, who was 84, had been in poor health for some time. Princess Andrew, or Princess Alice, her own name, was the daughter of Prince Louis of Battenberg. It's a very unremarkable announcement. Words of uh, respect, adoration, affection. It's, it's very cold. It simply marks the passing of a life defined by the men around her. Indeed, despite her position in the royal family, Princess Alice has long remained hidden from public glare. Many first discovered Alice through her portrayal in the TV series The Crown, when, as this clip shows, she had been living as a nun. Let this be a mother's gift to her child. Find yourself a faith. I didn't even know she existed. I had no idea who the Duke of Edinburgh's mother was. I think like the majority of people, she's been a very well hidden secret. It was never Alice's style to seek out the limelight. The princess didn't give very much away about herself. When she died, she left but three dressing gowns which were given to the nurses who'd been looking after her. By that stage, she'd given everything she owned away. She owned absolutely nothing. But Alice's start in life was very grand indeed. She's the great-granddaughter of Queen Victoria, and she was actually born in the tapestry room at Windsor Castle in 1885. As she grows up in the castles and palaces of Britain and Europe, Alice expects to marry a suitable royal partner. In 1902, the coronation of Edward VII provides a perfect opportunity for 17-year-old Alice to find a match. Edward VII himself remarked at his coronation that Alice would be the most beautiful bride of any young prince in all of Europe. A number of different members 
royal families arrived in London to attend this event. Princess Alice was one of them, and Prince Andrew of Greece was another. And here, Alice is swept off her feet by the young Greek prince, Andrea. That is really where the relationship developed, and it was a love match. It was a real love match. Just over a year later, the couple are married in Germany. It's a royal alliance with serious pedigree. Alice is the daughter of a German prince and a British princess, and the great-granddaughter of Queen Victoria. 21-year-old Prince Andrea is the son of King George I of Greece, himself a distant cousin of Queen Victoria. Andrew was a tall, blonde, handsome young army officer. His whole approach to life seemed to be very different from Alice, who was beautiful, but for the most part, reserved, silent. The newlyweds head for Athens in 1904 to start their married lives together at the royal palace. It's a dramatic change from Alice's life so far. The marriage was clearly a culture shock for Alice. I mean, she, for once, didn't know any Greek. Athens must have been kind of a cultural wilderness in certain respects for Princess Alice, and the palace itself wasn't exactly grand luxe. The royal palace in Athens was, by all accounts, rather drafty and dark. A more significant problem for Alice is that the Greek monarchy is not a stable one. Greece had only existed as a country in its own right for 70 years, following the breakup of the Ottoman Empire. So it had to create its own monarchy. In 1863, Greece turned to Denmark's royal family for a king, and they chose one of their Danish princes. King George I of Greece had been imported from Denmark, so none of the Greek royal family had any Greek blood whatsoever. They had Danish blood and they had Russian blood. The fact that the family came from Denmark and were not Greek clearly created some problems for them in Greece, uh, problems that would continue in terms of the monarchy there. Despite the national ambivalence to the new royal family, the Greek people take to Alice immediately. She certainly provided a great injection of, of glamour in, into the Greek royal family. She was a bit almost Diana-like because she was regarded as, as the prettiest princess in Europe. She quickly learnt to speak Greek and she quickly started producing children. Alice enjoys her new life in Athens. Within two years, she has given birth to two daughters, Margarita and Theodora. But there are clear signs that trouble lies ahead for Alice and for her family elsewhere in Europe. The beginning of the 20th century was a difficult time for the European monarchies. There was unrest, particularly in Russia, uh, and this unrest was also to be found in Greece. A sense that monarchy had had its day and revolutionaries were beginning to, if not seize power, at least to agitate for power. A tragedy in Alice's family born out of this unrest, would prove to be a huge turning point in her life. Her favorite aunt, Grand Duchess Ella, lives in Russia with her husband, Sergei, the Governor General of Moscow, a man with dangerous enemies. She was married to uh, the Grand Duke Sergei of Russia. And in 1905, Grand Duke Sergei is horribly assassinated by a bomb which, which, which blows his carriage into smithereens outside the Kremlin. And this had a profound impact on Ella, who gave up her material wealth and used her time and resources to feed the poor and become much more religious and set up a convent. Alice goes to visit uh, Russia, I think in 1909, and she sees the amazing work that her aunt Ella is doing, which directly affects Alice and affects how she chooses to lead her own life. As Greece edges closer to war with its neighbors, Alice would soon be given the chance to follow in her aunt's footsteps and risk her life to help others. By 1912, Alice has been living as a Greek princess for eight years. She and Andrea now have three daughters. Cecile was born in 1911. 
However, their lives are set for a dramatic change as Greece goes to war in a bid to seize new lands. There was a particular war in 1912, the First Balkan War. The Ottoman Empire, which had been so dominant in the Balkans for hundreds of years, was crumbling. So Greece was wanting to expand north and eastwards, taking over some of the Ottoman territories, which historically had many Greek occupants. And the Greek royal family are absolutely at the centre of this because Andrea is a military officer, so he's on the front. As her husband heads off to the battlefield, Alice takes the bold decision to leave her three children behind and follow him to the front line. Alice felt that she needed to, to do something for her adopted people. She goes to the front lines and works as a nurse. As the Greek forces advance, she sees that there are a huge number of victims, both civilian and military. She commandeers buildings, she, she organizes nurses and doctors, she, she has an amazing role in that Greek war effort in, in the Balkan Wars in 1912. Alice immediately threw herself into the whole business of sort of creating field hospitals, taking part in operations. For a young woman in her 20s with no medical training, she shows great grit and an innovative sense. Alice doesn't restrict herself to just setting up the hospitals. She was hands-on. I mean, she was dealing with broken limbs and amputated limbs. In a series of letters that easily detail that the corridors were running with blood and people were minus arms, minus legs. And Alice was having to deal with all this, but she wanted to deal with it because the calling from her was that she was helping and she really was helping. Very early on, we see that she doesn't conform in the way that's expected of her. Uh, and she does the things that she feels are important and thinks of others before herself. It's a very, very different sort of world to the world she's been brought up in uh, and earns her enormous respect from those around her. Alice has yet again proven that she can overcome great personal challenges in her life. As a child, it was realized all was not well. She was a very bright young girl, but at first her learning was slow because she had this problem, first of all, undiagnosed and then later diagnosed as deafness. Her mother believed in a kind of tough love and had a sort of let's get on with it kind of attitude and didn't treat uh, Alice any differently from her other children. And let her learn how to lip read and let her fight her own battles rather than mollycoddle her. Alice rose to the challenge and became a skilled lip reader. She lip read in German and English, which were her first languages, and later on in Greek and French. So Alice had this very severe disability, which she overcame, um, but that must have had quite an influence on her personality. Three years after the end of the Balkan Wars, Alice finds herself in the midst of another war zone. At the outset of World War I in 1914, Greece takes a neutral position. But two years later, it has been drawn into the conflict. Of course, the First World War is regarded as the war to end all wars, and it's easy to forget about the terrible suffering in Athens at that time. Athens is bombed by the Allies, and typically Alice. Then she has to start helping again. December 1916, there's terrible malnutrition. And so what does Alice do? She joins in setting up soup kitchens, in just trying to get food to the people of Athens in, in the dark heart of the First World War. As Greece finally joins the Allied forces, the tide turns against the royal family. There was the rise of a, a Republican movement in Greece during the First World War. They targeted uh, the monarchy as being foreigners, as being parasites on the system, as not belonging to Greece and not being Greek. Fourth baby daughter are forced into exile in Switzerland with most of the Greek royal family. This is the first time that Alice gets a taste of what it is to be a Greek royal. Alice had no sense of when she would be returning to Greece and indeed what life was going to be like for her over the next few months. And, you know, they weren't luxurious months. As she adjusts to life 
exile, Alice receives news of an appalling family tragedy during the Russian Revolution. The Russian royal family, including Alice's favorite aunt Ella, was caught up in the civil war. And in July 1918, aunt Ella, along with several other members of uh, the Russian royal family, were driven by the Bolsheviks to the Urals. Ella and five male members of her family were taken by the revolutionaries to this disused mineshaft. They were thrown down and then rocks and stones were thrown on top of them and a grenade, which obviously killed them. But until that moment of their death, they were stoic and they were singing psalms and saying prayers. Alice is grief-stricken, of course, but she's even more admiring of the strength of courage and will. Relief and respite finally comes to Alice in 1920, when the exiled king is restored to the throne in Greece. In this rare piece of footage of them together, Alice and Andrea are now back in the land they call home. Andrea and Alice and their four daughters by this time, they spent most of their time um, on court, the island of Corfu at a, a villa called Monripo. And that's where Alice and, and the four girls and their servants and their British nanny, Miss Roos, are living in 1921 when at last the beloved fifth child and longed-for son is born. The arrival of Prince Philip, Philippos Andreo as he was called, completes Alice and Andrea's family. But they would not have much time to enjoy life with their new baby. Greece is once again looking to take land from Turkey in their on-off conflict. Andrea is now a major general in the army. And when the Greeks suffer a humiliating defeat and are sent packing by the Turks, the royal family is back in the firing line. Andrea is a scapegoat for the, for the dramatic defeat of the Greek forces. He comes back to Athens in disgrace, is arrested, is accused of high treason, is put on trial with other officers. The other officers are actually executed. Andrew being sentenced to death. And this was, you know, as dangerous as it got. A last minute behind the scenes deal involving the British government, King George V and the Greek leaders saves Andrea's life. A British cruiser is dispatched uh, to Athens. And this show of strength is sufficient to have Andreas released, and the young family uh, is then in exile once again. But at least they're alive, and Alice is thrilled to have her husband back. Prince Philip, who was, you know, literally a babe in arms at this time, and taken for safety uh, onto the British warship, carried in an orange crate, and that was to be his means of escape. So really, really uh, dramatic days. They may be alive, but Alice and Andrea flee Greece with little money and few possessions. Now they are in need of a safe home for their young family once again. Andrea was lucky that his brother had married somebody rich called Marie Bonaparte. And they have several properties on the outskirts of Paris. And they gave one of these properties to Andrea and Alice as a home for their children, because Andrea and Alice had to leave everything behind. Alice and Andrea would spend eight years in Paris. The turmoil they've lived through is finally taking its toll on them. The marriage is beginning to fray at the edges. For Andrea, this must have been quite difficult after a very active life. Basically, he was no longer a prince in Greece, that, that, that he was exiled for life. This phase was very difficult for Princess Alice because she had been through enormous amount of trauma, and all those deaths in the family and, the, and her husband almost being put to death himself. I mean, that would be enough to shake anybody. As their time in exile wears on, Alice's behavior becomes increasingly erratic, behavior that would lead her family to take action that would scar her for years to come.
came from hell. Shake up, do you wanna be to go? Wings up, shake up, move. Paris. Princess Alice and her family are now safe, living in exile. But for her, a personal inner struggle is about to begin. One that will define the next ten years of her life. It's not for nothing that completely isolated by the deafness, by the strangeness of the country, by her innate compassion for other people, that she should become deeply religious. In 1928, she converted to the Greek Orthodox Church, which having, having actually been a Lutheran all that time, so that showed a, a spiritual growth in her. A relaxed Alice can be seen in this rare footage. Just a year later, the memory of the brutal murders of her relatives in Russia and the increasing alienation in France all start to take its toll, and Alice's religious fervor increases. She decided that she was able to heal. And she had what she called healing hands. That becomes quickly overshadowed by Alice's uh, declarations that she is hearing voices, that she's in a relationship with, with Jesus Christ, that she's having a physical relationship with Jesus Christ. I mean, she's beginning to be clearly suffering from uh, religious delusions, um, which of course become really distressing to those around her. She is sort of a sense out of her. Her mother is particularly concerned about her. And I think the understanding or the realization is that she needs to have proper medical supervision. This is sister-in-law, Marie Bonaparte, is a trained psychoanalyst. She recommends Alice should see Dr. Ernst Simmel at Schloss Tegel near Berlin the first inpatient clinic for psychoanalysis. Alice did not want to go to the Tegel Clinic because she didn't see that there was anything wrong with her. But when her doctor said that Jesus had told him that she needed to go, which was certainly a, a fairly sneaky way of doing it, Alice obviously agreed and she went to the clinic. After therapy sessions with Alice, Dr. Simmel diagnoses her as a paranoid schizophrenic. It was believed that her mental illness was a result of sexual frustration, that she'd fallen in love with a young Englishman and this was an unrequited relationship and that had made her really go mad by uh, suppressed, repressed sexual desire. And in another twist to Alice's story, Dr. Simmel takes her case to his colleague, the founder of psychoanalysis, Dr. Sigmund Freud. Now, at that point, Freud suggests what is probably the most shocking or the most bizarre, the most puzzling recommendation in the history of psychoanalysis. He suggests to Zimmel that Princess Alice's ovaries should be exposed to high intensity x-rays. The first time I read this, I, I just couldn't believe what I read because it hardly counts as a psycholytic intervention. Freud suggests the medical procedure rather than therapy, as he thought it would, in his words, rejuvenate Princess Alice. But the results are devastating. Because the exposure of the ovaries to high-intensity x-rays would effectively mean 
to use a strong word, that Princess Alice would be castrated, that her menopause would be accelerated and, and so would be rendered sterile. Alice's ovaries are x-rayed, but it does nothing to improve her state of mind. Alice was maintaining throughout this period that there was nothing wrong with her. She didn't want to be at the clinic. Nevertheless, she was forced to undertake some of this treatment against her will. She stayed there from February to April when she discharged herself. Alice's suffering doesn't stop there. Her mother, Victoria, perhaps embarrassed by Alice's behavior, conspires with the family doctor to send her to another clinic. So Alice's mother took Prince Philip out to lunch you know, on a picnic, and by the time he came back, which was really, really sad, they forcibly had to inject her and, and sedate her to get her to the clinic. What was done then was effectively in breach of every convention of civil rights. She was admitted by force on the, on the instructions of her mother and against her will to a psychiatric institution. Alice is sent to the Bellevue Sanatorium in Switzerland. Princess Victoria was generally concerned about her daughter, that she should have proper medical attention. But I think a large part of it was the need to, to keep her out of the way, that she was a potential embarrassment. Alice had delusions that Christ had given her a special religious mission. She had put these thoughts to paper in an attempt to share them publicly. Sending them off to newspapers and things. And I, you know, I think she was once um, intercepted when she was trying to post something to some publication or another. I mean, they didn't want her uh, taking her strange, as they would have seen it, strange views into a public arena. They were nervous about that because that would have been uh, shameful or dangerous. Alice's battle with mental illness is compounded by the fact that she's being held against her will. Over two years, she misses the landmark moments in her children's lives. She didn't attend um, the weddings of any of her four daughters. Uh, and that must have been a matter of great um, regret and unhappiness for her. Whilst her daughters are married and making their own way in life, Philip, her son, is still just a 10-year-old boy missing his mother. He's always said, well, this it just happened. There wasn't really much that I could do about it. We, I just got on with it. But that must have left a real mark with him because he'd been much beloved by both parents in the first nine years of his life. Alice's husband, Prince Andrea, sees their marriage as effectively over. Broken and feeling betrayed, Alice tries to escape in July 1932. So during lunch, her nurse is, has gone out of the room and she makes a bid for freedom. And she jumps out of the window into the flower bed and heads off to the nearest railway station, which isn't far away. And she got as far as the uh, the train station. I think she even got as far as into the carriage, where they and they kind of found out that she was there. She's arrested uh, and brought back, much to her disgust, uh, and and therefore her her escape attempt hasn't worked. Alice's desperate act convinces her mother she should be transferred to an open sanatorium in Murano, Italy. She had been at this point a prisoner in Bellevue, you know, at her basically, and her jailer was basically her mother. It was her mother that she had to... This isn't a teenage Alice. This is a woman in her middle age. No longer institutionalised, in autumn 1932, Alice faces the biggest challenge of her life. At the age of 47, could she recover from her ordeal and regain her sanity? She begins by choosing to distance herself from family life and from royalty. She drifted around Europe for several years, so up until 1937, she was living, you know, with, a, with one family after another and particularly sort of settling near Cologne, discussing religious topics, very, very involved with all the things that were interesting her, but not involved with her family. This sort of extended gap year of her trying to perhaps find herself, but certainly not living the life of a princess, in many ways sort of living off grid. I mean, we don't know very much about her which is sort of quite remarkable, of course, um, that she kind of disappears. Alice probably thought that with her independence of mind, with her freedom of expression, it wouldn't be easy 
to go back to her own family, including her mother, who would always be looking over her shoulder, because that would always contain the risk that before long, she'd be sent back to a psychiatric institution. Alice's decision to live a solitary life means her youngest child, Philip, is still being raised by relatives. I think it's important not to pity Alice during these years, but neither, I believe, should she be reviled as this heartless mother and callous wife who forgot all about her family and spent her time roaming aimlessly in Germany. What about her husband? After five years wandering across Europe, passing from friend to friend, Alice starts to feel like she can finally reach out to her loved ones. The connection with her family begins to be a bit closer as she, in a sense, recovers her health. Uh, she begins to communicate with um, her family a bit more, write letters to Philip. Uh, he's encouraged to write back to her. And so the, the family begins to come back together. But of course, there's to be a terrific tragedy in uh, 1937. Alice's daughter, Cecile, pregnant with her fourth child, is involved in a tragic accident. Her beloved daughter, Cecile, who's married Don, a prince of Hesse, and they're traveling by plane, rather an untried technology, it turns out, in, in 1937. The plane hit um, a chimney in Ostend in thick fog. And so Cecile, her husband, her two boys, his mother and various other people were of the accident. And this was a horrendous event in the family. Cecile and her husband were members of the Nazi party and the funeral is held in Germany. This is the first time Alice has seen her family all together in seven years. Cecile's death could have broken Alice forever. But instead of being plunged into a dreadful, dreadful gloom, because of her strength of will, I think she probably thought nothing worse than this can ever happen to me, so I'm going to get on with my life. And she actually recovered her equilibrium and came out of her phase of religious fervor and started to lead what would be considered a much more normal life. Out of the latest tragedy, Princess Alice emerges with a renewed sense of purpose. But her return home to Greece throws up another test, one that takes her into a clandestine battle against the Nazi forces. In 1938, Princess Alice, mother of Prince Philip, returns to Greece to serve the poor. During her 16-year exile, she survived hardship and horrific tragedy. However, once again, she will soon be placed at the heart of momentous historical events. The onset of World War II requires her to draw on her reserves of courage and bravery. When German tanks roll into Athens in April 1941, the Greek royal family flee to safety. Despite the dangers, Alice decides to remain, to continue her work. I don't think that Princess Alice ever really wanted to leave Greece. I mean, that was where she belonged. She was a Greek princess by this stage and she felt that's where she could be most useful. The Nazi invasion has devastated Athens and thousands are left destitute and starving. Alice helps by volunteering for the Red Cross. I think one of the extraordinary things is given the scarcity of food that she's able to create one of the largest soup kitchens in the world at the time. And it says something about her determination, her contacts and her ability to get things done, that it's such a success. And she feeds thousands, particularly children, young children, who are either orphans from the war or refugees, those who are helpless. This is Alice at her humanitarian best. As war continues to... She's completely fearless. While, while bullets are flying, she's on the streets of Athens taking supplies to people in need. And she's heard that you, you don't hear the bullet that kills you. And she says, I won't hear it anyway because I'm deaf. However, Alice is about to take an even bigger gamble with her own safety. 
Athens is home to around 8,000 Jews. Amongst them, the Hamaiki Cohen family, prominent members of the community who have ties to Greek royalty. Evie Cohen is their only surviving direct descendant. At the beginning of 43, uh, it became obvious that the decisions against the Jews to take them to concentration camps was starting to be obvious. My family had to go in hiding. Evie's father, Alfred, decides the family's best hope of refuge lies with Princess Alice. Now he must find a way to contact her. By an extraordinary coincidence, a chance encounter with her lady-in-waiting results in a message getting to Alice. I'm going to read out part of the text my father had uh, written about this part of the story. For us, it was an absolute miracle. In short, that lady immediately went to see the princess, and an hour later, we were informed that the Princess Alice would be more than happy to take in my mother and sister. I think it was uh, Alice taking an enormous risk because she may have faced a firing squad uh, because she had harbored uh, the Jewish family. It was an enormous risk. When the German generals came round looking for any Jews and perhaps having been tipped off that perhaps there were Jews being sheltered by Princess Alice, she said, simply, I can't understand. I don't know what you're talking about. And they just thought she was a silly woman and left her in peace, which is just as well, because if she'd been caught, she would have been in serious trouble. People were being executed for looking after Jewish families, but Alice had no fear. Her faith was her shield. Incredibly, the Hamaiki Cohen family are never discovered by the Nazis. Alice keeps her own bravery a secret. If it hadn't been for her, I wouldn't be alive today to, 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 to say all this. And my parents would have met and, and so many other things. Back in Britain, her son Philip has spent the war years re-establishing the family's close links to the British royals, thanks to the patronage of Alice's brother, Lord Mountbatten. Keen to improve his nephew's prospects, Mountbatten encourages Philip's blossoming romance with Elizabeth, the future queen. Princess Elizabeth, and she was, of course, delighted. And though she hoped that one day maybe he might become a Prince of Greece, the fact that he was in her own homeland, Great Britain, and had fallen in love with the British princess, who was going to be heir to the throne, she was very, very happy. However, in 1947, when Philip, sixth in line to the Greek throne, gives up his title so he can marry Elizabeth, for his mother, the news is bittersweet. Alice, in many ways, you know, this was no doubt a personal disappointment, but at the same time, here was her only son, of course, marrying the future Queen of England, and so it seems that she was kind of reconciled to that and accepted that, even though, of course, it came at the cost of Philip renouncing his claim to the Greek throne. Soon after Philip and Elizabeth's engagement is announced, Alice travels to England to see them. Keen to provide her son with the engagement ring, she had already arranged for some of her royal jewelry to be retrieved from a secure bank vault in Paris. She had no money, so she wasn't gonna be able to buy an exquisite gift for her future daughter-in-law, so she took one of her tiaras to Philip Antrobus, the jeweler. And she said, take the best stone out of this, and I want it fashioned into a ring for my future daughter-in-law, which is a very romantic thing to do. And I think it is about Princess Alice wanting her son to be seen as good enough in many ways. So here, perhaps for one of the only times in her life, playing the role of a sort of proud, slightly pushy, mum who, you know, wants her son to do the right thing and being seen to be appropriate as a husband to the future Queen of England. On the 20th of November 1947, Philip and Elizabeth prepare to walk down the aisle at Westminster Abbey. The eyes of the world are centred on Buckingham Palace. Two greys draw the Irish state coach. Inside, Her Royal Highness Princess Elizabeth and her father. In one of the rare occasions she steps back into the royal limelight, Alice is present amongst the crowned heads of Europe.
And now they are man and wife. It was, for the British people, a wonderful celebration for the horrors of the war. It was a joyous occasion. And Alice was very, very moved to see her son so happy. In the official wedding photograph, Alice can be seen standing next to the Queen's grandmother, Queen Mary. Her life has come full circle at the age of 62. There she is. It's been a moment of great pride for her that lovely Lilibet was marrying her marvellous son, Philip, and, and it was you know, a new beginning. Over 40 years since she first left England, when Prince Charles was born the following year, Alice is firmly back in the bosom of the royal family. Philip and Elizabeth have their first child, Prince Charles, and Alice is absolutely delighted. She's thrilled. She's very much included as part of the family. After their years of separation, Philip wants his mother to stay in England. But ever the individual, she shuns royal life and beats her own path, sticking to her charity work in Greece. I think that after um, Prince Philip had married Princess Elizabeth, she felt that to some extent she could then do what she liked. You know, her, her daughters were all married and they had families of their own and he, was, he now had a family of his own. So she fulfilled this long-held wish to found a nursing sisterhood. Despite not taking formal vows herself, in January 1949, Alice founds a nursing order of Greek Orthodox nuns on the island of Tinos. She is now able to do what she had long wanted to, that is to follow in the footsteps of her beloved Aunt Ella, who had set up an institution of nuns dedicated to service, to serving the community, not shut up in a distant cloister, but living amongst the people, those whom she could help. And Alice wanted to do the same. And I think this is what motivated her, finally, to set up her sisterhood. Alice is at last fulfilling what she sees as her life's mission. While she has now re-established her links to the British royal family, when she attends Elizabeth's coronation in 1953, as this rare footage shows, her choice of dress signifies both her status and her dedication to her charitable work. Princess Alice of Greece, mother of the Duke of Edinburgh, wears the dove grey habit of her religious order. People are surprised to see her dressed in her nun's outfit. But this is no ordinary nun's outfit. This outfit was made by the couture house Balmain in Paris. So she is a nun, but she's a very stylish nun. There she was, walking through Westminster Abbey, behind the royal party, alone, in her grey nun's habit. Really quite odd. And I think it's quite telling of the way in which she was dismissed, really, throughout her life as being a bit odd, a bit mad, a bit of an eccentric, and not somebody who could be easily embraced within the royal family. Once again, to continue her charity work. But despite her royal connections, her religious order is running out of money. For Alice, who had no real funding behind her, apart from what she could raise herself and she could raise from her family, uh, the, the sisterhood desperately needed funding and, and started to, to fail but she knew she couldn't keep it going forever because unlike Aunt Ella, she didn't have personal wealth to keep something like this going. And it was just running down, sadly, for her. The end of Alice's dream finally comes in 1967. After a military coup, King Constantine II has to flee Athens. The whole Greek monarchy are potentially in danger. Once again, the position of the Greek royal family becomes very threatened and precarious. And so it's seen that right now, really, um, you know, Alice has really come to the end of the road in Greece. She needs to be rescued. She simply can't stay there. It's not safe for her to stay there. When Queen Elizabeth hears about her mother-in-law's fate, action is taken and she's flown back to Britain. The moment Alice arrives at Buckingham Palace, vividly dramatized in series three of The Crown. She arrived in one of the Queen's Rolls Royces in her overcoat. It was July and all the windows had to be shut. She knows Buckingham Palace. It's not the first time she'd been there. But she's just aghast at the money 
and the space. Your Royal Highness. Thank you. Please, this way. She's put in one of the maids' rooms at the top, which she doesn't mind. It's the most palatial room she's had in years. She was very unsettled to begin with and complained and made a fuss. Um, but eventually, eventually, she realized how lucky she was. She made friends in the way that she always made friends, and, and she settled down, and she was very happy. After being forcibly separated from her son, Philip, when he was just a child, he and Alice are finally making up for lost time. Philip had been effectively abandoned at the time where his mother was put in a sanatorium. So one can imagine these were an opportunity for mother and son to get acquainted with each other and to reflect on um, her life and perhaps the legacy and the influence that she might have had and have on Prince Philip. Alice has finally found safety and stability in Britain after decades of selfless devotion to others. But her bravery during the war wouldn't receive the recognition it deserved until many years. It's 1967, and Alice is back in Britain, living with the royal family in Buckingham Palace. But she's set on doing things her own way. We know that she liked to smoke, that she smoked woodbines, and so courtiers would know that she was coming before they saw her by uh, the smell and the smoke of her cigarettes. And of course, she would also move around uh, in her nun's habit. So a very odd uh, spectacle by all accounts. Princess Alice couldn't have been more different than the, than, than the Queen Mother, who, who was the other grandmum, and who, who was, you know, a wonderful self-publicist, going out and doing all her duties. Alice was the very uh, opposite to that. You know, there she was, smoking in her nun's outfit. But the children liked her. Prince Charles really liked his grandmother. She used to tell him tales about Queen Victoria, which he loved to hear. After two years of getting closer to her son and his family, Alice starts to become infirm. On the 5th of December 1969, aged 84, she dies peacefully in her sleep. Her death was really announced without any great fanfare. Certainly when we compare the public affection towards um, the Queen Mother, um, Princess Alice has a very different position in um, the nation's affections. Really, people didn't really know her. They still don't really know much about her. The funeral itself was a relatively small affair. I suppose in keeping with Alice's own life, which always emphasised service rather than status. Prince Philip, he said what an extraordinary thing it was that she had been born in Windsor Castle, and after a difficult life of wars and tragedies and separations and living in different lands, she had come back to Windsor Castle again. Before she died, Alice gave very specific instructions about her final resting place. She wanted to be buried uh, in the Russian Orthodox uh, Church in the Mount of Olives by the side of Aunt Ella. So. Uh, a very particular request and a very difficult request um, to honour. It isn't until 1988 that Alice's family are able to fulfil her dying wish to transfer her remains to Jerusalem. Despite the dangers she had faced during World War II, Alice's work was not recognised until long after her death. In 1994, Prince Philip was in Israel to see his mother posthumously awarded the title of the award was given for Alice's bravery hiding the Hamaiki Cohen family from the Germans during World War II. She was a person with a deep religious faith and she would have considered it to be perfectly natural human reaction to fellow beings in distress. Princess Alice, she didn't even think for a minute. She just uh, heard there were people that were in danger and that she felt that she could do so, something for them. The story of Princess Alice and my family is, um, is a beautiful one, and it can, I hope, uh, be um, an example for the young today to continue to do good things in life, to be human. 
Both Prince Charles and Prince William have since travelled to Israel to visit Alice's tomb. As the years elapse, the work, the selfless work that she did, is seen as something that the royal family are incredibly proud of. Um, and I think she is, her, her legacy and her life is being embraced much more by the royals and even the younger royals. And obviously that's very, very good to see. So I think she's been a great influence. And I think, you know, on the whole royal family's attitude to humanitarian activities. Alice was a royal like no other. The twists and turns of her life spanned much of the 20th century and coincided with pivotal moments in history. Alice's life was on the outside looking in. And that was why she was able to help people so much. That was one of the joys of playing her. Because she didn't give a damn what people thought about her. She had suffered uh, really a, a huge series of disadvantages from her deafness as a child through to the problems of exile as a royal princess, a mental illness. And throughout of all this, she rose triumphant as, as, as an inspirational figure amazing character who indefatigably survived through some of the toughest events of, of the 20th century and, and triumphed as, as a sort of humanitarian icon, a really remarkable life story and one that shouldn't be forgotten.